Good morning once again, and welcome back to the National Conference on Making Higher Education Accessible and Available 2022. As we begin session four, we will focus on the theme, clarifying the purpose of education, serving the unserved. This session will discuss the need for the information gathered through education to be translated into transformative action that benefit the neediest in society, and concur that education must be laced with the higher idea of human values for the welfare of humanity. We are honored to have with us Madam Kunavati Amal, Senior Teaching Fellow, National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, all the way from Singapore. <laughs> We're also happy to have with us Ms. Smitha Bhatnagar, Chief Executive Officer of the Sewa Manager Ni School from Gujarat. And Dr. Suma J. Chandran, all the way from Malaysia, a faculty in research at the Manipal Global Next University. We will begin the session with Madam Kuna, who was trained at the, as a teacher in the, at the National Institute of Education, National University of Singapore. She earned a further professional diploma in the educational program and was the head of department at the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University. She is passionate about effective education, which focuses on developing students' belief systems, emotions, and attitudes. The underlying principle of, effect of effective education is that in order to learn traditional subjects optimally, students must also develop their personality. In her capacity as vice principal in three secondary schools, Madam Kuna has initiated several pupil development and leadership programs and learning circles both for students and teachers. She will talk on the topic, redefining education, nurturing positive thinking in our students for the future, an educator's endeavor. Madam Kuna, please. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, well, uh, since I'm going to talk about positive education, I just want to check on your mood. How happy are you now? Are you looking forward to lunch? Tired? Hungry? No? No. If you look at, uh, can I have my first slide, please? Ah, look at this. Why am I showing a picture of myself doing skydiving? Have you ever thought about doing something uncomfortable? Coming out of your comfort zone to do something that you think maybe I, I'm not able to do this, but after you've done it, the feeling of, you know, a sense of achievement. Having gone through skydiving, when I came down, I landed, I said, wow, I did it, I did it, I did it. You know, that kind of feel. Now, can you like just turn to your neighbor, the one sitting next to you? Uh, just talk about something that which you did, you know, out of your comfort zone. And you're glad that you did it. A quick one, a quick buzz with the person next to you. You're buzzing, talking about that whatever endeavor, out of your comfort zone, doing something, and then you said, Boo, I'm so glad. I actually did it, and I can do it. And you know, if you were to ask me, I want to go for skydiving again. At the height of 12,000 feet, I jumped. And that was at the age of 50, 55. So you can calculate my age. Huh? That was a few years ago. That was about five years ago. So you know what my age is. Isn't the feeling great? So talking about positive thinking, right? Now, I. I want to formally greet, but I'm going to start with the Singapore greeting first. Chao Sheng Hao, Selamat Pagi, Vanakam. And a very good morning to one and all present here at this conference. Now, I've said good morning in all the four official languages of Singapore. A place I was born in, I was bred in, where opportunities were given in school for me to learn my mother tongue, Tamil, as a second language. Now I want to wish you um, in Kannada, Sabodaya, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm pronouncing it correctly. 
in telugu subodayam malayalam suprapra uh, suprabadam and last but not least in hindi suprabad i hope i got it right i'm delighted to be here to addressing to addressing you at this conference aligned to the theme clarifying the purpose of education serving the unserved now this is very close to my heart and speaks volume of the why and the what of my existence as an educator and the how as a follow up in the pursuit of this noble mission let me start uh, with my own travel trajectory you know as a student as a teacher as a head of department vice principal a young lecturer in a polytechnic and teacher educator can you imagine i've gone through the whole spectrum primary secondary tertiary you know started off as a student becoming a teacher and so forth so that gives me enough wisdom you know to talk about the changing educational landscape of singapore that spent over a few decades from 1960s to current and that's an interesting phenomenon to understudy and comprehend the redefinition of education that i saw and i felt and tried to make sense of so that i can make a positive impact on my students as they embrace the future being future ready quote unquote future ready my endeavor is based on immersive percent experiences i just mentioned can we have the next slide the next slide yeah look at this this slide shows the four major changes of the singapore education system that i i was and i am part of survival driven 1965 to 1978 that was the post war era i was a student then primary and secondary i went through with the british withdrawing its troops and singapore separation from malaysia to become an independent nation in 1965 the future looked very bleak for singapore an island a small island referred to as a little red dot with no natural resources people were only its so resource mainly migrants from different parts of the world the focus then was to building singapore industrialization economic growth building of infrastructure building more schools providing jobs housing and bringing about social cohesion i remember vividly the racial riots of 1969 i was a little girl then my mom reminded me that i must have my daughter the bindi or puttu on my forehead as i step out of the house so that i would be left alone by the chinese and the malays because there was mounting tension between the two racial groups educational goals therefore uh, were crafted in tandem with the Sing singapore's economic growth socio histo historic historic and political development as a new nation that concluded an important aspect the social integration part for harmony in a multiracial and multilinguistic society this era marked the introduction of bilingualism as a cornerstone of singapore's language policy lee kuan yew the founding father of our modern singapore and then prime minister said this he firmly believed that knowing one's mother tongue was necessary because it provided access to one's cultural heritage thereby strengthening one's values and sense of cultural belonging the education system was based on meritocracy anchored on fairness and equal op opportunities an idea that resonates so much with me because i came from a family of low social economic status i'm actually a byproduct of these policies effectively bilingual in english and tamil and having risen to the level that i am today credit to bilingual policy and meritocratic principles that uplift uplifted me the next phase as you can see on the slide efficiency driven 1979 to 1996 that era saw a shift in focus in economy to capital and skill intensive from uh, from labor intensive having implications for education multiple pathways were created for students facilitated by the streaming policy channeling students to express stream normal academic normal technical streams to move on later or to junior colleges polytechnics and technical institutes accordingly based on their abilities paving the way for quality education 
and reducing significantly student dropout from school. There was also a need to prepare our students for technically skilled labor force in demand for the economy. Being academically inclined, I went on to, my, to do my GC O level, A level, completed my university education at National University of Singapore, and then uh, followed, that was followed by teacher training and started my career as a teacher and moved on to become a head of department. That was the year 1997, was a watershed year. Thinking Schools, Learning Nation, TSLN. Actually, in Singapore, we're very famous to come up with acronyms. ICT Master Plans, with focus on self-directed learning, SDL, and collaborated learning, collaborative learning, COL. National Education, NE, and Desired Outcomes of Education, DOEs, were key initiatives introduced that marked another phase ability-driven aspiration-driven, with a focus on innovation, creativity, and research in response to the growth of the global knowledge economy. In 2005, 2005, teach less, learn more, TLLM. That was a phrase actually introduced by our Prime Minister, Lee Hsien Loong, to open up more white space in the curriculum to engage students more deeply in learning. Teachers teach less students learn more, which means the messaging is simple, quality and not quantity that matters. There's, there's an obvious shift away from overemphasis on academic results and broadening the success, the definition of success beyond grades. Content was trimmed and streamlined. Teachers were exploring pedagogies to customize teaching and learning, catering to the abilities and interests of students providing more flexibility choices and promoting positive thinking. Social emotional learning, SEL. Civics and moral education, CME values. 21st century competencies, 21st century CC. Community involvement program, CIP. With the requirement of every student to fulfill a minimum of six hours of community service every year. Were mooted as platforms and programs for student exposure and experiences for character development. Teacher education was upgraded to equip teachers with the right skills and competencies for facilitation of learning, not over teaching, uh, and, and, and the inculcation of values that should come in rather than over teaching, as I said, for exam results. Slide three shows the various initiatives and programs that I just talked about, TSLN, NE, TLLM, and so forth. You see how it has been placed you know, in the different eras. Because the society has become more affluent, so the changes were necessary, okay? And societal needs have to be addressed uh, so that the future of uh, students, family, community, and society at large can be uh, thought through. These changes were necessary and aim to touch the hearts and engage the minds of learners by promoting a different learning paradigm in which there is less dependence on road learning, repetitive tests and instruction, and more on engaged learning, discovery through experiences, differentiated teaching, learning of lifelong skills, and the building of character through innovative and effective teaching approaches and strategies, encapsulated by our former director of education, General Ed of Education, Ms. Hoping. As a head of department, and subsequently as vice principal and a young lecturer at a polytechnic, I found this era very exciting and heading towards a direction that allows for students to learn for life, building confidence for a new tomorrow. The natural progression to the next phase, student-centric, values-driven education from 2011 to current is anchored on framework for 21st century competencies and student outcomes. The core values at the center, we call this our Swiss roll, okay? The core values at the center include respect, responsibility, resilience, and national values. Students will learn skills from five interconnected uh, key social emotional competencies in the outer circle. Self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, social awareness, and relationship management. That forms the outer circle. This is followed by competencies that are necessary for the globalized world, 
we live in. Civic literacy, global awareness, cross-cultural skills, critical and inventive thinking and communication, collaborative and information skills in the outermost circle. Together, the core values and competencies will help our students embody the desired outcomes of education so that they are able to capitalize on the rich opportunities of the digital age to be confident persons, self-directed learners, active contributors, and concerned citizens. In 2015, I went on, uh, uh, on a secondment to National Institute of Education as a teaching fellow teacher educator from Ministry of Education. I was part of grooming teachers, educators for schools, in the discipline of character and citizenship education, we use the acronym CCE for that. In the social context of Singapore, I witnessed all the changes that were made with the redefinition of education from an academic focus to a holistic development of students. The CCE curriculum went a revamp in 2021. The provision of various platforms and putting students through meaningful experiences in school are means to this end of preparing and nurturing them to be future ready, to be able to flourish in a fast changing world with values to be successful, moral and committed citizens of the country. The vision of the student-centric values-driven education was unpacked with four attributes. Every student, an engaged learner. Every school, a good school. Every teacher, a caring educator. In fact, now we're using the phrase, every teacher, a CC teacher, which means you teach values all the time, in the canteen, along the corridor, at the field, you know, at the science lab, and so forth. So it's, it goes beyond the classroom. And every parent, you need the support of the parents, the stakeholders. Every parent, a supportive partner. These are the four mandras to propagate, to propel CC. What you see here is a shift to redefine success in school and rebalancing the education system towards a holistic education and values centricity. Success in schools is no longer measured from just academic uh, grades alone, but from a broader perspective of our holistic education that includes more non-academic attributes, student character, student leadership, for a better balance between joy and rigor. My travel log of the Singapore education system as a student, teacher, HOD, BP and teacher educator so far, it's just an overview of the historical, political, social, economic perspectives of why there were so many uh, policies, initiatives that were brought about and how and why they gradually evolved to the current focal point, which is the student-centric values-based education. Now, I came across an endeavor of a school principal, very interesting, in Singapore. He wrote this letter to parents before the exams which is testimony to the redefinition of education and its reinforcement. Look at what he said in the letter. Dear parents, the exams of your children will start soon. I know you are all really anxious for your child to do well. One exam or low marks won't take away their dreams and talent. And please do not think doctors and engineers are the only happy people in the world. Please don't take away their self-confidence and dignity from them. Tell them, it's okay, it's just an exam. They're cut out for much bigger things in life. But please do remember, amongst the students who will be sitting for the exams, there is an artist who doesn't need to understand math. There is an athlete whose physical fitness is more important than physics. There is an entrepreneur who doesn't care about history or English literature. There is a musician whose chemistry marks won't matter. If your child does get top marks, that's great, but if he or she doesn't, tell them, no matter what they score, you love them and will not judge them. Please do this, and when you do, watch your children conquer the world. That was great, isn't it? What this principal saw in his students were positive sparks, you know, in their dreams and aspirations. This letter prompted me and I'm sure would prompt any one of you to think about definition of uh, you know, education and success and relating it to our role as educators and students out, of, uh, out there. You'll be thinking of what is it for me in my role as a student? How do we prepare you, you know, for the future? 
pertinent question that we need to be, uh, that needs to be answered. Now, intrigued by the notion, futuring. I got all of this book, titled Futuring the Exploration of the Future. That's by Edwin Cornish. I got what I wanted, the power to create and invent your own future. Edwin Cornish, uh, Cornish defines futuring as the act, art, or science of defining and evaluating possible future events, and all geared up for the use of the practice of futuring, to explore possible futures and act in ways to make that future happen for you. A future-oriented discourse that he recommends to all of you. And I chanced upon another book titled Planning by Futuring, Futuring as Planning by Richard Bernato, who recommended nurturing all of us, children, adults, all of us, you know, um, to, to, to be using what he calls futures-based mindsets. Mindsets, disposition skills that will enable us to anticipate and plan for an emerging future that may come our way. According to him, this mastery will allow you to create futures that are preferred, not the word, huh? preferred, not imposed. Okay? Now I refer to the principal's letter to the parents again. As much as we see and feel the positive sparks in our students, they need to be enlightened, guided, nurtured for futuring, to chart a new future for themselves. To do that, we need to work on developing, as uh, Bernato said, developing futures-based mindsets that you know, Bernato refers to and the use of practice of futuring that Edwin Cornish has put forward. It looks like this is a formula for the VUCA world. What is the VUCA world? V-U-C-A. V, a future that is volatile, just like the weather, so unstable and unpredictable. Uncertain, the U part, due to unexpected events, unpredictable human reactions, war like the Ukraine, you know, war that's taking place now. C for complex, due to, uh, it is a non-linear interconnectivity and talking about webs of causality and many influences affecting our ecosystem. A for ambiguous, the lack of clarity, the incomplete information, or vagueness in ideas, terminology, and contradictions that exist. Very often, we end up having blind spots, you know, about our own students or children. We see them from our mental models, our perceptions, our hopes, our dreams and aspirations. I didn't become an engineer, I want my child to be an engineer. I am actually guilty of that. And I was expecting my own nephews to be aiming to become a doctor, lawyer, engineer, the conventional, you know, uh, professions that we always, you know, try to gear our students towards. My elder nephew, Shankar, made it to mechanical engineering at National University of Singapore. With the COVID situation, he found it difficult to get a job, cannot get a job upon graduation. No mechanical engineering job came. But something came up. An IT-based company, multinational technology company called Shopee, invited him for an interview. And he said, let me give it a try. And he went. It focuses on e-commerce, and that's the way it's going now, right? Online shopping, e-commerce, and all that. So that was the only job offer that came. Today, he works for Apple, an American multinational technology company that specializes in consumer electronics, software, and online services. So look at him making that switch. Uh, skills in demand, looking at what are the skills in demand. I don't mind learning IT. Anyway, he had a little bit of interest in that. Now he's found out more about IT and he loves it. So he's moved on to another company. My second nephew, Prem, it's the other guy, has just completed his national service. Now, national service, NS, is the national policy in Singapore, mandated by statutory law that requires all male Singapore citizens and second generation permanent residents upon attaining the age of 18 to serve a compulsory uh, military service in the uniform services. It could be Army, Navy, Air Force, Police, Civil Defense. For two years, they have to do that. And having served NS, the Navy part of it, Prem was like pondering what to do next for his tertiary education. He had graduated from Polytechnic with a diploma earlier. 
He decided to do engineering, but he said, I'm not going to do it in Singapore. I'm going to go to New Zealand. But why New Zealand, we were asking him. He said, I'm very clear what I want. I want to change from Singapore context, right? And he said to him, the degree in engineering is just to give him some foundation. He may or may not become a mechanical engineer. He said, I'm open to making switches to suit the times. He said, I'm flexible and adaptable, Ate, Ate is uh, aunt in Tamil. I'm aware of what possible future developments there can be. So he's actually doing this futuring exercise, studying the future. Okay, able to ex uh, assess and make better decisions, have goals set, and find means to achieve them. Just give your blessings, Ate, he said. Actually, I was impressed. I saw this futuring exercise adopted by him that included the element of prospection, being able to cast far into the future, to making predictions about your future and working towards it. Make things happen for you. Give me hope. However, how many of our students have that sort of clarity to self-help and self-motivate themselves? What do we do about these children? But before I do that, I need to understand and comprehend what this future is all about and what it holds for our students. Is the vision of the future encapsulated in the fourth industrial revolution, 4IR, in which emerging technologies change the very essence of our human experience that Klaus Saab uh, introduced in his book, Fourth Industrial Revolution in 2016. To me, it looks like it. That is the future, the fourth industrial revolution. As the fourth industrial revolution unfolds with artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, quantum computing, synthetic biology, robotics, automation, creating real realities which previously we thought, you know, we could not even imagine. This revolution should be seen not just technology-driven change, but as an opportunity to harness and create an inclusive human-centered future that has the ability to positively impact families, organizations, and communities, according to World Economic Forum report. This lends itself to the question of what essential skills for the fourth industrial revolution are needed in order to better guide our students. According to World Economic Forum, the skill set required in both old and new occupations will change in most industries and transform how and where people work. It has listed top 15 skills, which you can see on the screen. Analytical thinking, innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, originality and initiative, leadership, social influence, technology use, monitoring and control, technology design and programming, resilience, very important note, resilience, stress tolerance and flexibility, Reasoning, problem solving, and ideation. Emotional intelligence. Troubleshooting and user experience. Service orientation. Systems analysis and evaluation. Persuasion and negotiation. I think in the last, uh, you know, right from uh, Convocation Day and yesterday's uh, conference and today, we've been hearing a lot of these traits and skills that we need. Using these skills as the backdrop and based on my afterthoughts and reflections anchored on my exposure, my experience and my enlightenment through readings and anecdotes, I pull together an A to Z matrix for you. As I see futuring as a positive venture and an advocate of positive education and appreciative inquiry, I believe that nurturing positive thinking in our students is the way to go in preparing our students adequately for the future. It definitely has a constructive effect on students' mental, physical, and emotional well-being by increasing positive emotions. When you are happy, that contributes to your growth. And that's growth mindset, success and desirable outcomes will come your way. So I'm gonna go through very quickly the A to Z. Look at what I have for A. You need that sense of advocacy and agency in all of us, right? Whether you're a student, teacher, or a parent. Attitude, foremost, positive attitude to start the day, right? Awareness, acceptance, and, acknowledge, and acknowledgement. And attention, attention given to good things. Appreciative inquiry, showing your appreciation, abundance mentality, sharing and caring. 
uh, application, practical skills, adaptability, flexibility. And for B, we start up beliefs. You need to believe in yourself. Believe in what you stand for as a student, as an educator. All right, broadening and building theory. Positive emotions, how it broadens you know, uh, one's uh, self and, and uh, encourage novel explor exploratory thoughts in oneself. And that will have impact on a repertoire of skills that you can pick up. And balance of this moral performance and civic character. And brain work, I think you know, on the first day convocation, or I can't remember whether it was yesterday, someone mentioned about brain work that's important. Values, you know, how are we making use of these values? You can, you know, it's like a double-edged sword. The knife can be used for both good and bad. So that kind of thing. So brain work is important. C, character and compassionate meritocracy. What Singapore is trying to do is to talk about meritocracy has now evolved into compassionate meritocracy, which means we give all the opportunities, you know, uh, platforms, experiences, and all that we give you. But in return, what are you going to give back to society? Right? That's something that we are talking about is paying forward. Right? Giving back to society. And I mentioned about caring educator. Every teacher is a CC teacher. Conviction, I mentioned about it. Creativity, the way to go. Competencies over credentials. That's more important. Not so much as I've got distinctions and you know, I'm a top student in A-level. That's not important. What's important is how you carry yourself as a person. And the competencies and skills you know, to relate to people, to relate to whatever you're doing. Consciousness is an interesting term. Level of awareness of how your mind works and remaining conscious and you know, mindful about things. Commitment, that's, that's important. Commitment to whatever you, know, you, you want to pursue. Adopting a can-do, I can-do attitude. That's the positive thinking. Communication and collaboration for the common good. Cognitive reappraisal, that means turning the situation, reframing it to something positive, you know, and willingness to learn, unlearn. Relearn, if that needs to be, okay? And capitalizing on positive emotions with active, constructive responding, right? The next part, dispositions for D, that kind of relates to uh, attitudes and attributes, so the right disposition that we need to have. What is in demand? What is, you know, I need to know, I need to know in depth, you know? So shallow thinking should not be there. So questioning. You know, questioning for clarity, values clarification, all that should come into play. We talk about 5D cycle in appreciative inquiry. Discover about yourself. Dream your future. Design how your future would look, uh, look like. What steps would you take to reach there? That's your destiny, right? And E, empathetic reasoning. So important, this empathy, understanding feelings of others, putting yourself into the shoes of others, you know, and, and reasoning about it. Emotional quotient, we are talking about emotional quotient. It's not just the IQ. We're talking about EQ. There's also AQ. AQ is adversity quotient. How you stand up, you know, when you face adversities in life. How you bounce back, right? And environment, taking note of the environment. You are part of the environment. We are like part of the system. So understanding impact and implications. And experiment. Go out there. Be the courageous you to try out new things, don't be afraid. The experiences we are talking about, edutainment here, we want to bring in the joy of learning. You know, it's, I know you, uh, the youngsters love to play games, you know, computer games and all that. There's so much into that. Can we bring that productively, positively into the learning part of it? Um, example, be a good example. We talked about that, you know, we need to role model. Gratitude, we have spoken so much about that and goals and growth mindset I spoke about. This thing about future sense, I spent a lot of time talking about future sense, having the foresight, futuring as I spoke about, facilitation and giving feedback. Of course, one of the speakers earlier talked about that, head, heart, hands. It makes sense. Cognitive, um, effective and psychomotor, right? Humor and happiness, how important it is. The high points in your life, honesty, humility, hone the craft and skills. And we're talking about I, inspirational narratives, and we heard so much of it, uh, you know, in the past two days. Inspirational narratives, stories, identify opportunities, have that inner source of positive, positivity coming out from you. And it is interest motivation. Having an identity for ourselves, introspection, reflection, internalization, being intentional about it. 
and integrative approach we talked about, multidisciplinary approaches that would you know, make you a more broader uh, person, uh, having broader perspectives. And for L, lifelong learning, learned optimism, learning space, language, using positive language. Joy, as I say, joy of learning. K for kindling curiosity for learning. Kindness, knowledge about self and others and other things. Mastery, of course, you know what mastery means, content, skills, competencies, and making meaning out of it, all right? Networking for N, very important, networking for greater benefits. The needs, the narratives. Q, I mentioned about questioning, O for opportunities, openness. P for passion, that drives you, the purpose, the principles behind. And picture your best future. Having a portfolio, so important in today's world. Pushing the boundaries. And S, scripting your own narrative. Savor, enjoy what you're going through. Self-talk, positive self-talk. Scenario sketching, I think uh, the earlier speaker spoke about that in his uh, engineering ethics. Scenarios, case studies, strengths-based, skills future, support system. And R, resilience, rational thinking, review. Do a lot of review and reflection of where you are and you know, what do you do next. And research skills and relationship building. T, touch points. This is important. Find, look for a book called Touch Point that has got a lot of good things to tell you. Transformational, teachable moments. You, understanding, profile, needs, interests, and be unique. I think we talked a lot about having our own uniqueness. Be unique. Values in action, living values. Values clarification. Values are thought and caught in both. You know, it is caught. It is also intentionally thought. Visualize positive outcomes, voluntary opportunities. What, um, talk about valuing diversity, voices, student voices, teacher voices. Have that X factor, have that wisdom, yin and yield, and have the zeal for better performance and zest for life, right? And in conclusion, what I want to say from our education minister, he said this. He put forth three phrases from an article from uh, Michael Arnold, um, he said, know the way, look further, and have a deeper understanding of how the world is evolving, and know how the context for work is changing. Secondly, he said, show the way, review priorities, plans, and share with them with the team. It is all about teamwork. We're not working in silos here, right? And next, why wait? Go the way. Support educators in what they need, role model what that needs to be done. As John Shaw has said, the future is not some place we are going to, but a place we are creating. As educators, understand that we cannot change yesterday for our students, but we can change tomorrow by what we do with our students today. And I really thank you for the opportunity given to address you at this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Kuna, for your engaging talk. And we really love the emphasis that you place on each student realizing their potential in whatever they are passionate about, not just in academics. Our next speaker is Ms. Smitha Bhatnagar. Ms. Smitha currently heads the Sewa Manager Nee School, which is the training vertical of Sewa, or rather, the Self-Employed Women's Association in Gujarat, which strengthens the managerial, technical, and soft skills of grassroots women and their micro-enterprises. Ms. Smitha also works on various programs in agriculture, micro-enterprise, development, capacity building, and liaises with partners like the United Nations, World Bank, academic institutes, governments, and more. With over 30 years of experience, Ms. Smitha holds a doctoral degree along with an MBA and many certifications from IIM, Yale School of Management, Cody Institute, and much more. She will touch upon the topic, impact created on society 
by empowering people with specific skill sets. Ms. Smita, please. Namaste, everyone. A very good morning. And I take this opportunity to thank for calling us because it's, I'm representing Self-Employed Women's Association, 2.1 million members across 18 states of the country. And today we are celebrating, today, no, this year we are celebrating our 50 years of incorporation. So it's our pleasure to be here. I'll very quickly share uh, the profile of members that we work with, and I have a small presentation. And I have two of my teachers here with me who will be joining me at the, in the stage. Uh, may I have the presentation slide, please? Next. Do I have a clicking? Can you take the down? Can I have the clicker, please? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so I'll start with the quote of our founder who says that poverty is a form of violence and where there is poverty, how did it go back? Where there is poverty, there is injustice and exploitation of the individual, the community and the whole environment. And we help the poor women fight poverty and lead a life of self-reliance and dignity. That's our overarching goals. So to talk a little bit about our organization, as I shared, we are an association of 2.1 million members. And for us, education has been always been at the core, be it a formal or an informal education. So we are actually going through learning at every step of life. And as ma'am also said, it is not just learning, but unlearning and relearning because all our learnings happen from each other. We believe a lot in sister to sister and peer to peer learning. And we have our own manager school because there was way back 30 years back there was no school and I don't think even today there's any school who would give admission to our illiterate or assimilate women in helping them move towards sustainability of their enterprise teach them the management skills or teach them the soft skills or what is needed to help them lead towards self-reliance. So when we are, this is something that, am I shifting it? Yeah, okay. So these are the four broad categories where our informal economy members are divided into. We are all vendors and hawkers. We are home-based workers. We may be having a lot of skills with us or we may be go and sell our products, we offer our labor and services, and we are producers and service providers. So these are the broad categories we represent our informal economy members. Ah, so we are actually, as a trade union, we are the Self-Employed Women's Association, but as I said, we, our goals are full employment and self-reliance of our members. So we are family of organizations. So today we have more than 110 cooperatives promoted, 15 economic federations, three producer companies, and the chief executive officer of our not-for-profit company is here with me, who, is, uh, who will share her journey. So since we, can, we are such a family of organizations and all the organizations are run by the members themselves, and the members' profiles are very diverse, coming from semi-literate or illiterate background. So how do they learn to run their economic organizations? Sustainability was always a challenge, and that's where in one of our annual general meetings, our members, divided, uh, our members demanded, why don't we have our own school that teaches us on all these aspects? So here we have set of members organized into groups, federated, and today they have their enterprises. So it was like, you know, I am the shareholder in the company, I'm an executive committee member, but I'm not very clear as to what role I need to execute. If I'm signing the balance sheet, am I doing the right thing? What is it that I need to study and analyze? And that's how, I, as I mentioned, they wanted a school of their own that could provide these education to them. I would like to show a small clipping Through our strong membership of over 1.3 million, 
in the informal economy and our experience spanning four decades. Today, our seva is just like a banyan tree with a wide stretching canopy. It has deep reaching roots as represented by our 18 economic organization functions and our capacity building body. We, the women members of SEVA, embody the institution and the institution is embodied within us. We are SEVA. SEVA is us. शक्ति विकास धीमे धीमे थो अतरे हूँ बीजाने पर तालीम आपती थी और अतरे हालीम को तालीम आपी ने मार जी बीजे बहन ने तैयार करो आम दौड़ाया पी तो मैं मंडल ने कर मंडल कर धंधो अत्यार बिहार न करो पर मैं नुकसान आवा पड़ी मैं कोई खबर न पड़वा मड़ी पी मैं बात कर सेवा में मैं तालीम में तैयार करो तो मार सारूँ रहे पी से मैनेजर की कुल साथ मैं पड़तन दी तालीम ली थी कोस काढ़ कोस काढ़ तालीम लीजिए पसी मैं आ धंधो नहीं खबर पड़वा मड़ी और पसी मैं आवक नहीं खबर पड़वा मड़ी और आम तो हूँ कॉम करके करूँ ना तो मैं नुकसान ना तू सो दिस इज स्मोल क्लिम्स सो For us, our objectives are how do we work out the training modules, the pedagogies, because our profile of the members is different. So for us, we create at Seva Managing School, we create a cadre of master trainers and whole range of training modules. We have our own learning ladder, which we may be from primary to higher secondary, our own steps of uh, teaching our members, but all our Trainings are demand-based and members ba based on the needs of our members. So whatever the needs emerges out based on that, it's a very participatory approach through which we develop the training modules and also the pedagogies. Because I don't think anybody from our profile of members would be able to sit through a long hours understanding the concepts, very difficult for them to understand and then apply. So how do we make it very practical, very fun learning? And for that, we have partnered with various institutes. We don't have all the knowledge. We have partnered with the academic institutes and the various technological and technical institutes with the reason of learning from each other. So even like the first batch we did was with the Indian Institute of Management, which is a premier institute. But we, they did a batch for us on how do we redesign a course for our members, make it in a very practical, applicable manner. What makes us unique is, as I briefly shared, we have our own cadre of trainers, decentralized training centers. We have 55 training centers and we have more than 7,500 master trainers. We call them as young leaders who go ahead and provide the trainings in their own blocks and villages. Our trainings are not necessarily in the classroom. They are beneath a banyan tree or beneath any tree in the village, but it is in the cluster of 15 to 20. Sisters join together, take the learning, and it's like, you know, uh, we call it as an on-the-job and apprenticeship kind model. It's not just learning, but also applying the learning, and which is like long-term hand-holding or mentorship that we give to our members. And through the decentralized training centers, our trainers provide the training, and we go through the whole grind of assessing our trainees, train master trainers as well, because we want the message to pass on to the grassroots members exactly the same way as we want it to go. And hence, we have this cadre of trainers. We do an assessment with outside assessors, and we have graded them into as gold and silver uh, master trainers. The shares about some of the impacts, I'll not go much into detail because I want my teachers to speak as well. Uh, these are some of the quotes of our sisters. But I would like to invite Savita Ben, who's the CEO, who's been with us for the last 43 years and have taught all of us a lot. She will, in short, share her experiences. So I have been, this is through the decentralized centers, how we provide the training, the slides talk about that. Meanwhile, we can hear Savita Ben would be talking in Hindi. I'll be translating the gist in English. Namaste, everybody. I'm uh, Savita Patel, and I'm from Seva. And 
मैं बी तक पढ़ी हूँ मगर मीडियम गुजराती में मेरा एजुकेशन है इसलिए मैं इंग्लिश में समझ सकती हूँ मगर बात नहीं कर सकती हूँ सॉरी मैंने सेवा में फोर्टी थी और से मैं काम करती हूँ और जब से मैं जुड़ी तब से रूरल एरिया में महिलाओं को संगठन करने का रोल में मैंने काम किया है गुजरात का फोर डिस्ट्रिक्ट में एक एक डिस्ट्रिक्ट में मैंने थर्टी फाइव थाउजेंड फिफ्टी थाउजेंड महिलाओं को संगठन संगठन में जुड़ी है और उसकी जो समस्या है जो हमारा रोल है वो संघर्ष एंड विकास संघर्ष एंड डेवलपमेंट करने का आर्थिक डेवलपमेंट तो हमने महिलाओं को संगठन में जुड़ के फिफ्टी फाइव कोऑपरेटिव विमेन कोऑपरेटिव मिल की बनाई है और वो मिल कोऑपरेटिव में ओनली फॉर महिला शेयर होल्डर है तो हमारा गुजरात में एक अमूल मॉडल है जो पूरा एशिया खंड में सबसे बड़ी जो डेरी है मगर गुजरात में कोई भी डिस्ट्रिक्ट में विमेन कोऑपरेटिव नहीं थी तो हमने जब विमेन कोऑपरेटिव की हमारा संगठन की बात लेकर हम डिस्ट्रिक्ट मिल्क यूनियन के पास जाते थे गुजरात मिल्क मार्केटिंग फेडरेशन के साथ बात करने के लिए जाते थे तो सब लोग ना बोलते थे, थे कि नहीं विमेन की कोऑपरेटिव कैसे बढ़ सकती है वो कैसे कलेक्शन के टाइम में डेयरी पर आ सकती है वो कैसे फैट टेस्टिंग कर सकती है वो हिसाब का काम कौन कर सकती है और स्मिता बहन ने बताया हम जब ने गांव में जब शुरू किया तो पूरा विलेज में एक भी महिला ऐसी हमको नहीं मिलती कि जो अपनी सिग्नेचर करे तो हमने उसके साथ साथ उसका धंधा के साथ साथ उसका सिग्नेचर करने का भी सिखाया और हमारे साबित करने का था कि गाँव में बहनों महिलाओं साई कर सकती है तो हम जब कोऑपरेटिव बनाने के लिए बहुत सारा कोशिश करते थे तो एक बार डिस्ट्रिक्ट मिल यूनियन एग्री होते थे तो रजिस्ट्रार ना बोल देते थे कि नहीं आप नो ऑब्जेक्शन सट्टी ले आओ गांव का आप डिस्ट्रिक्ट का नो ऑब्जेक्शन सट्टी ले आओ कि हमको कोई ऑब्जेक्शन नहीं है तो हम घूमते रहते थे और महिलाओं के लिए महिलाओं को कोऑपरेटिव में जोड़ने के लिए और मिल्क मार्केटिंग फेडरेशन का अप्रूवल लेते थे गांव का लेते थे डिस्ट्रिक्ट मिल्क यूनियन का लेते थे फिर ऐसा करते करते हम 55 मिल्क कोऑपरेटिव महिलाओं की बनाई है और उसको हमारा फेडरेशन के साथ मेंबर बनाई है और ऑन गोइंग क्या वो हमारी महिलाओं तो पढ़ी लिखी भी नहीं है और कोऑपरेटिव चलाने के है तो उसका जो एग्जीक्यूटिव कमेटी है उसको भी ट्रेनिंग हम करते रहते थे उसका जो बिल कलेक्शन के समय में हम पूरा रजिस्टर में उसकी एंट्री करने की उसकी पासबुक में एंट्री करने की फैट निकालते हैं तो फैट के आधार से उसको पैसा मिलना चाहिए वो भी सिखाते थे क्योंकि गांव में सब गांव में वेंडर्स घूमते रहते थे दूध लेने के लिए तो दूध जब वो ले लेते थे तो उसका फैट के आधार से पैसा नहीं देते थे जितना ही सबको एक सरखा ही देते थे पाँच फैट वाले को सात फेट वाले को सरखा ही पैसा देते थे तो वो गुंचाल में से निकालने के लिए हमने बहुत सारा कोशिश किया था और गांव में एग्रीकल्चर ग्रुप भी हमने टू हंड्रेड जितना बनाया है अभी तो ज़्यादा हो गया है मगर मेरे मेरे चार्ज में मैंने टू हंड्रेड एग्रीकल्चर किसानों का ग्रुप बनाया था किसानों का ग्रुप बनाकर हमने हमने खुद ने एग्रीकल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी में ट्रेनिंग ली और ट्रेनिंग लेकर हमने मास्टर ट्रेनर बनाया गांव गांव में से और वो गांव में जाकर किसानों को ट्रेनिंग करते हैं और उसकी समस्या क्या है तो खेती करने के लिए उसके सीजन आती है तो पैसा नहीं होता है और पैसा लेने के लिए साहूकार के पास जाते हैं तो फाइव परसेंट से वो पैसा लेते थे तो इसमें से निकालने के लिए हमने किसानों को बैंक के साथ जुड़ान कराया हमारी खुद की महिला बैंक है इसमें से भी हम क्रेडिट देते हैं बार बार सीजन में दो बार साल में हम क्रेडिट देते हैं और क्रेडिट देकर जो किसान उत्पादन करते हैं वो मार्केट के साथ जुड़ान करने का काम भी हम करते हैं और हमारी एक रूढ़ी मल्टी ट्रेनिंग कंपनी भी बनाई है जो किसान किसानों जो उत्पादन करते हैं वो हमारी रूढ़ी मल्टी ट्रेनिंग कंपनी में 
परचेज कर लेते हैं और परचेज करके वो महिला हो सब साफ सफाई करती है पैकिंग करती है और हमारा जो संगठन का जब विलेज है गांव वहाँ वो रूढ़ी बेनियम बोलते हैं उसको वो वो सेल करने के लिए जाती है तो अभी मैं जो करती हूँ वो गांवों में हैंड एम्ब्रॉयडरी करनी जो करने वाली जो महिला है जो हमारा होम बेज वर्कर की कैटेगरी में है वो उसको जब वो एक स्किल थी मगर वो काम करके प्रोडक्शन करके वो मार्केट तक नहीं ले जा सकती थी क्योंकि उसने मार्केट की मालूम ही नहीं था कि मार्केट कहाँ है हम कहाँ जाकर हमारा प्रोडक्ट को हम सेल करेंगे तो हमने वो महिलाओं को संगठित कर करके बाद हमने सी टू बी बी टू ए ग्रेड में ले जाने के लिए एक गांव में से मास्टर ट्रेनर तैयार किया और वो आर्टिजनों का हमने ग्रुप बनाया है और तीन डिस्ट्रिक्ट का मिलकर 250 आर्टिजनों का ग्रुप है जिसमें 10,000 थाउजेंड महिला वो ग्रुप में है और उसके लिए हमने एक आ, आ, एक कंपनी एक्ट में रजिस्टर करवाया है जो उसको हम सेवा ट्रेड फैसिलिटेशन सेंटर बोलते हैं वो कंपनी का शेयर होल्डर हमारी महिलाएं हैं और उसका बोर्ड में भी महिलाएं हैं और वो महिलाओं जो प्रोडक्शन करती है वो हम मार्केट तक सेल करते हैं वो एग्जीबिशन में ले जाते हैं ऑनलाइन पर बेचते हैं और बायर्स का ऑर्डर लेकर हम प्रोडक्शन हमारी महिलाओं को पास कराते हैं इसलिए उसकी जो रोजगारी है वो बढ़ती जाती है और उसको नियमित रोजगारी मिलती है तो उसका बोर्ड में भी हमारा जो शेयर होल्डर है वो है वो कंपनी के मैं अभी सी ओ हूँ क्योंकि मैंने अहमदाबाद आई आई एम में एक बिजनेस मैनेजमेंट एक मेंट की ट्रेनिंग ली थी और ट्रेनिंग लेकर बिजनेस का प्लान बनाने का उसको मॉनिटरिंग करने का और किस किस टाइम में ब्रेक लगाने का वो पूरा कोर्स मैंने किया है और मैंने डेयरी कोऑपरेटिव का भी एक कोर्स किया है तो वो लेकर ऑन गोइंग महिलाओं की समस्या हर रोज बदलाती है हर महीने में बदलाती है वो लेकर हमने ऑन गोइंग काम करते रहते हैं हम भी सीखते हैं और हम महिलाओं को भी सिखाते रहते हैं मगर जो हमारा देह है वो महिलाओं को संगठ संगठित करके उसको वायबल करने का उसको पगभर करने का और वो खुद पढ़ी नहीं है मगर अभी आगे की पीढ़ी हमारी जो हमारा मेंबर था फर्स्ट पीढ़ी का उसकी जो लड़कियां हैं वो अभी पढ़ के टीचर बनती है डॉक्टर बनती है मामलतदार बनती है अभी पढ़ने लगे हैं तो थैंक यू So sorry, I just want to uh, provide the gist. As you all of us know about the Amul cooperative model, and Savita Ben was sharing that we have we have created more than 55 cooperatives of women. They are fully owned and managed by women. And in a way, she is trying to share with all of us that women can do anything. Today, we in all the four broad categories, we have several several uh, activities in which women are involved. So we have organized the women. producers the women farmers the women embroidery artisans everyone and having their own enterprises to run in a sustainable manner for which we train ourselves and take the trainings for the to our members today we even have members women who are repairing doing the hand pump repairing which is called a typically male dominated jobs so we all believe in we all know about the women's uh, strengths so when we talk about education for us it is an action research we learn by doing we learn from each other it is a sister to sister learning we go to other successful places and see how they run what is it that we need to teach them and what is it that we need to learn from them and we also tie up with the institutes to formally learn and apply those principles as she shared today it has become inevitable for us to do digital marketing so we need to learn about that as well Thank you, Savita Ben. Uh, so I would now want our Miss. Can I have the mic? Can you have the mic? Ah, okay. Jaldi ho tu. हर जगह पर ऐसा ही होता है. गुजरात में भी हर institute में जब हम हमारा मेम्बरों के लिए master trainer बनाने के लिए जब तालिम की बात करते हैं ना, तो हर educate 
एजुकेशन में ऐसा ही होता है कि हम तो इंग्लिश सिखाने वाले हैं हम कैसे हिंदी गुजराती में उसका मॉडल बनाइए और हमारा मॉड्यूल भी नहीं है हमारे पास तो हम एग्रीकल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी गुजरात एग्रीकल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी का प्रोफेसर को मिला और हम बोला आप गुजरात में हो और गुजराती भाषा में मॉड्यूल नहीं बना सकते हो तो आप स्पेशल बनाओ और हमने सेवा ने सेवा का जोर से हमने एजुकेशन एग्रीकल्चर यूनिवर्सिटी में हमारा मेंबरों के लिए मास्टर बनाने के लिए हमने मॉड्यूल भी गुजराती में बनाया था क्योंकि और निफ्ट कॉलेज है गांधीनगर में उसका तो प्रोफेसर बोला हम कभी बोले ही नहीं है गुजराती में तो हम कैसे आपकी महिलाओं को सिखाएंगे हम बोला जितना गुजराती प्रोफेसर है ना वो इसमें भाग लो और मॉड्यूल बना के हमारी महिलाओं को सिखाओ और नहीं चलेगा क्योंकि पूरा बनतर से नहीं चलता है देश ऐसा प्रोडक्श प्रोडक्शन करने वाले से ही चलता है हम उसको बोले थे तब वो लोगों ने तीन प्रोफेसरों के पास मॉड्यूल बनवाया था और हमारी महिलाओं को कट टू फिनिश की ट्रेनिंग उसी टाइम एक साल की दी थी और बोला कि नहीं हमने सिखाने में बहुत मजा आई क्योंकि अपनी महिला हम बोलते हैं सब सीख लेते हैं तो sorry we have lot to share from this so basically we are trying to say that even the professors and teachers need to understand our needs and adapt the modules and because we are the producers we are the part of the important part in the economic development so if we are not taught how are the professors going to also benefit in the contribution to the economy of this country so i would like to now inv uh, invite our uh, young leader she is now helping us learn how the changes happen in the world how do we embed technology with values how do we still continue with our value based education using the technology and other developments sudha ben is sudha ben comes from a tribal belt of gujarat and she will briefly share her experience she is one of our gold master trainers an excellent trainer and a young generation member नमस्ते मेरा नाम बारिया सुधा है और मैं छोटा उदयपुर डिस्ट्रिक्ट से आई हूँ ट्राइबल एरिया से और आई एम एसोसिएटेड विद सेवा फ्रॉम लास्ट फोर इयर्स मैंने मास्टर डिग्री किया है लेकिन मैंने मास्टर डिग्री के साथ साथ ही सेवा में जुड़ी हुई हूँ मैंने मास्टर डिग्री तो किया है लेकिन उसमें मैंने जो सीखा वो दूसरों को कैसे सीखा है उससे मैंने सेवा में से अलग अलग प्रकार की ट्रेनिंग के ली उसमें सभ्य शिक्षण है स्किल डेवलपमेंट एग्रीकल्चर लीडरशिप डिजिटल टेक्नोलॉजी जैसी दूसरे अलग अलग ट्रेनिंग के लेकर मैं छोटा उदयपुर डिस्ट्रिक्ट में सुखी महिला सेवा मंडल में हमारा 300 गांव है और साठ हज़ार सभ्य संख्या है मेंबर्स है साठ हज़ार इस सभ्य को हम कैसे पहुंचे? इसीलिए मैंने जो जो ट्रेनिंग के लिए है उसमें मैंने मेरा जो असेसमेंट हुआ है उसमें मैं गोल्ड मास्टर ट्रेनर हूँ और मैंने मेरे जैसी 50 मास्टर ट्रेनर मैंने तैयार की है वो दूसरों लोगों को ट्रेनिंग देती है और हमारे ज़िले में मैंने मास्टर डिग्री किया है लेकिन हमारे जो ट्राइबल एरिया है उसमें ज़्यादातर लड़कियां पढ़ाई नहीं करती इसीलिए मुझे अभी तो मैं जब भी इंटरव्यू लेने के देने के लिए जाती हूँ तब मुझे नौकरी तो दूसरी जगह पे भी मिल जाती है लेकिन जो मेरी गांव की और आसपास की जो लड़कियाँ है उसका हम कैसे विकास कर सके उसके बारे में मैं सोचती हूँ और मैं सेवा में सालों के साथ जुड़ी रहूँगी और हमारा और दूसरी बहनों का जो कैसे हम शक्ति विकास कर सके ऐसा मैं सोचती हूँ और सेवा मैं तो गुजराती मीडियम में पढ़ी हुई हूँ और सेवा में से मैंने इंग्लिश क्लास भी किया है अभी प्रैक्टिस मैंने शुरू है जो अगली बार मैं आपके साथ मिलूंगी तो शोर में इंग्लिश में बात कर सकूंगी धन्यवाद थैंक यू सुधा बेन सो सुधा बेन इज रिप्रेजेंटिंग अ ट्राइबल बेल्ट वेयर वेमेन गर्ल्स डू नॉट गो फॉर हायर एजुकेशन सो शी हैज डन हर मास्टर्स एंड शी इज वेरी प्राउड अबाउट इट एंड शी did her internship with us and then she started working with us and as i said she is a gold master trainer she has created a cadre of 50 trainers under her and she is striving to take all the trainings to our members there and attend she she has 
uh, enrolled for our English classes because today everyone feels that English has become a necessity. If we want to even learn online something, it has become. And that's why she is learning English. And she's saying that next time when she comes and speaks to us, she would like to invite you as well. She would be talking in English. So, so these, this is what our future is for Seva Managini School. We are looking, we call ourselves as a community college. We may not be per se recognized as such, but we think we are like a community college. And we are looking at having recognition to our trainers and we get us, uh, accreditation to our training programs that would benefit many and many of our members in the remotest area. And that's the dream that Seva Managini School is looking at to continue building the capacities of our members in all the states as well as South Asia where we work on. And one of the important things that Savita Ben spoke was, how do we do the lateral learning, learning from each other, and then develop modules which are very simple. Just as in Seva Managing School, we do a lot of games and stories and don't teach them the concept as such, but how do we apply the concept? So that's what we want to continue doing too. Today we have digitized our courses. Pandemic forced all of us to go digital. We have our own self-learning modules as well. But we feel with the profile and the sisterhood, we believe that we want to learn together. So we always apply blend of face-to-face -face learning and digital learning. So that was all I wanted to share. Thank you all. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much, Smita Ben, and Tanyavad, Savita Ben, or Sudha Ben. Very happy that you can see the way that the educating a woman, how it trickles down generation by generation. What a wonderful example we just witnessed right here. And our final speaker for this session is Dr. Suma J. Chandran. She's a researcher in education in human values and currently serves as a visiting professor for the American University of Sovereign Nations, and her research on spiritual human values and bioethics in environmental education has led her to become a training consultant, and she has led numerous teacher training workshops over the years in Southeast Asia. The focus of her work is in the integration of education and human values in the curriculum for environmental education. She has also authored a book called A Human Values Pathway for Teachers, Developing Silent Sitting and Mindful Practices in Education. Dr. Suma, please. Dr. Suma will also round up the session for us, and she will touch upon the topic, integration of values and ethics in higher education. Sairam, everyone. Namaste. And um, to my um, respects to the dignitaries here, as well as to all my brothers and sisters. So as I was sitting on the dais, I could see that some of you have gone into deep meditation, <laughs> nidra yoga. <laughs> so I studied in India, Coimbatore, but I'm born in Malaysia. So I studied in Aminash Lingam Home Science College for Women. And I stayed in Sai Baba Colony. And I didn't know Satya Sai Baba, so I went to Malaysia, and my father passed away. So did my mother. And there was no one to look forward as your own blood. And that was when Swami came into my life. Right. So Swami, in one instance, there was a big experience at the hospital in Malaysia, Suba Medical Center. And he told me, I'm a pilot. I work in a shipping firm. There were so many other things along with it. But when he said, I'm a pilot, I work in a shipping firm, I took this back to my friend. Maybe a year later, her husband was the captain of the ship. I think he, he could be even now in Thailand. And I asked her, do you know what Swami said? Because she was one of the Balvika students in Puttaparthi with Satya Sai Baba. Okay. So she said, you know, every ship has a pilot. I don't know whether you know about it, but that was new knowledge for me. Every ship has a pilot. The pilot, the main responsibility is to anchor the boat or the ship, okay, the ship. Whereas 
the captain can only sail the ship. So I knew what Swami was trying to tell me. He was telling me, I will anchor you in the spiritual journey. And that was fantastic experience because later, just the next sentence after that, he told me, I have centers all over the world. I give you a job, you work for me, okay? And I told myself, I mean, who is this person? He didn't appear in his form. But he said, I have centers all over the world. And I told myself, my little stupid mind, I was talking. I said, how can a person have centers all over the world? Okay. And there were so many other dialogues after that. And later, I came to understand what Swami was trying to tell me. The purpose of my life is to spread his message of human values. So today we heard a lot about so many different dimensions of, the hum of a human being. And how do we now merge with the divine? And that is something that I think is so important for us to know. And way back in 2004, when I was in Thailand, I did this particular thesis called Gurukula thesis. And so we heard from Professor uh, today how he emphasized on the Gurukula system. And so I researched a lot on education. And I went to world education because I believe in universal human values. And when I researched each aspect of ancient education, from the Greek, Mesopotamia, ancient India, Inca, Maya, Aztec, all of them started the education in temples or in mosques or in sacred places, very sacred places, okay? so. Now, why, why did education start in, the, say, in a sacred place? And this was my query, because it has to start from the Atma. It has to start from the Atmic principle. So, um, Satya Sai Baba gave us this, it's a beautiful jewel, the Gurukula system. He has immersed us with all the teachings so that we all become messengers. I can give you an example. When I was in Thailand with 21 teachers from different countries, I had a friend who came all the way from Ireland. And so I used to ask her, why did you come here? And she said, I used to see the silhouette of Krishna, Lord Krishna walking around in Ireland. Okay? And she was very, very, she would yearn to come to, to know more about it. What was it that actually, you know, uh, she, she kept telling me herself, why, why would I see this every day? And she teaches Irish music in the mountains there. So she came all the way to Puttaparthi and she saw Swami and Swami told her, go to Thailand, go and learn human values. So she came there, she was my friend. And so this is one drop in this big ocean where Swami wants us to, all of us to carry this message of love. Okay. It's just one drop because so many experiences. I know I asked each one of those students, why did you come here? Ranging from the age of 20 till 76, I know of teachers who came there because their purpose is not being fulfilled. They know something else is left. Their Atma is speaking to them. Sometimes we're not conscious of it. Now, the word educare has a sacred meaning. That which is manifested by educare cannot be seen by the eyes, cannot be heard by the ears, and cannot be felt by the mind. Now, all that education confers can be seen, heard, and felt. Education fosters desire and leads to rebirth, whereas educare confers immortality. This was stated in 2000 by the Vice Chancellor. Okay. Now, I, I'm a researcher and I told myself, how am I going to research something which cannot be seen, which cannot be heard, which cannot be felt? So I, I told myself, I need to go inwards. Otherwise, I will never get this answer, what EDUCA is. Of course, we have the five pedagogies. We have storytelling, we have silent sitting, we have group activities, we have prayers. And storytelling, so we use this in the classes to bring out values education. 
right? But that is outwardly. We are, but we are still working the inner, with, the, with the inner qualities of children. So uh, students, when they listen to music or storytelling, you do not know, you think you're uh, teaching music, you think, you, you think you're teaching, just telling a story, but there's a lot of research in the West where they tell you what are the contributions from storytelling. Storytelling increases your creative imagination. It gives you cultural knowledge. It helps you with social relationships. So when you look into this research, you will find the different benefits that you have just from one teaching technique, and that is storytelling. Apart from that, if you go into each one of the techniques that were taught, we will know that our preceptor has left us with a treasure of wealth, but we need to know why we are teaching. Why are we using these techniques? I was curious, so I inquired all the time. Why do we need to sit silently? So when we researched in Thailand as well as in Malaysia, I had only one answer. There was a group of teachers from one of the Asian countries. They were talking very loudly in the quiet school in Thailand. And they came to the school. They were very happy in the school. They, so they went through all the courses, and finally they said, silent sitting was the best. Okay? Silent sitting taught them something more than anything else. And they, they were very happy with this technique. So I decided to research on that as well. Um, now, you know, education has its origin in the Latin word, educare. This was said by Sri Satya Sai Baba in 2000. And I realized that if I need to learn what Swami was telling, I need to research on the teachings of the West. It's not just the East. It's not just about India. Swami said India is a compartment engine, whereas the rest of the world are the compartments. So you cannot have an engine without the compartments. All of us have to work together. Yes. And we need to work together for the mission that he has come for, to spread the values, human values. I will tell you my journey when I went to um, uh, Thailand to do this study, and I've listened to uh, many discourses from Prashanti and even from here, from Sri Sadhguru because everything is immortal, teachings of immortality, which we need to know before we die. I didn't have my uh, scholarship, I mean, I, I was not working, I was taking care of my uh, son, and so I was thinking I needed to do a PhD because I want to make a change with education. I went to Thailand, and then from there I did my master's. This was at the age of 34. At the age of 44, I did my PhD, and that was in education as well. And at the University of Sydney, I did this topic on human values, but with environmental education. And how did I go to University of Sydney? I was, very, I was a very proud person. I, didn't, I wanted to be independent. Because Swami said, you have to be confident, right? So I, Swami came in my dream with a big uh, paper. It looked like an application form. And then two weeks later, I applied to Australia. I got the EIPRS scholarship. I was, it was fully paid for. I didn't pay even a rupee for this particular scholarship, but I did my whole uh, study in University of Sydney. It taught me how to research well. So I started publishing papers on human values. I didn't care whether anybody was reading it. I just went on and on. And then I went to Sweden, because in 2030, many of our countries will be facing water scarcity. We will have floods, for sure, because of climate change. But water scarcity, how are we going to work with that problem? And that is why Swami did the water project before he left his mortal coils. How are we going to deal with water issues? We can have technology, we can have agriculture, we can have farming, but you cannot do without water. You must have, it's only 1% of fresh drinking water in the world. The rest is all salt water, which we cannot drink. And water, when we teach in schools, what do we teach? We say water is H2O, and we learn the chemical formula, but we never teach the quality of water, the purity of water. 
And how does water become pure? But we teach the idea of pollution. So we, you can see how our teaching uh, contents are taken to schools. And how does water get pure? We have an impact on the environment. Unless we are pure, water will never be pure. But we teach pollution. So student gets the idea only of polluted, how to deal with polluted waters, but not how on the purity of the mind or of our act actions. So th this is basic. So now we need to move from the Atma to the world, not from the world to the Atma. It doesn't work that way, right? Um, Swami Dayanand Saraswati said, a teacher does not produce anything. Nobody can produce knowledge. The teacher, he only throws light on something that is already there. So I just spoke about educare, something that you can't see. We are learning something that we cannot see. And how are we going to make sure that that grows? And remember, Swami calls us embodiments of love. We are embodied. So why does he say this word every time we go for darshan? Embodiments of love. And listening to some of the talks given by Sadhguru, I've, I've always felt that it is all about immortality. It's about Atma. It's nothing but Atma. And how are we going to learn about this? You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't feel it. We can pray. We can pray for some time. We can go to the temples. We can go to many different places. But then how are you going to learn this? OK, so this is, this is the light uh, that is uh, given by the teacher, produced by the teacher. Tre teacher only shows you the way. Like any guru can show you the way. But if you do not put your time and effort, we may not be able to achieve what we want. And in this beautiful place, I'm glad that Sister Gita was there to encourage me to come here. And then Brother Ravi Pillai called me. I happened to see, because I researched from the Gurukula, this is a beautiful Gurukula where all of our students worked hard every day for all of us. Thank you so much to all the students who are sitting here. You had served us. And we, we will never forget this. We will never forget this humility that you have. And I would also address to you that all of you who are going away from here to work for the society, make sure you carry that light and light a thousand lights. My father used to tell me, education is the only thing that you can give where many other people can be educated. That's only one thing. But today we have technology, okay? Uh, so we have to deal with technology as well. So he spoke about, uh, Swami spoke about bookish knowledge, general knowledge, discriminatory knowledge, practical knowledge. And I was very, uh, you know, I went again into research into all these different components. And the, the one on practical knowledge, uh, as I was coming here, I had a call from one of the biggest business uh, uh, industries in India, BSE. The CEO said, I want to meet you. So I said, okay. So I, I, went, I met him just before I came here. He told me very interesting uh, events that, they, that he has seen. And I thought, why does he want three hours with me? Because he has signed up to do his uh, PhD in education after being a great businessman. He has come into education. Why education? He said, I want to be a teacher. So he gave me so many different case studies. And students, some of you want to do business, right? Some of you have learned masters in economics. He gave me a very good example of why the atmic knowledge is very important. He told me that he studied in uh, uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands. He grew up there. And today he's heading one of the biggest industries. And so I asked him, uh, how, did you get, how did you become so great? And he said, I, my father was working in the government. I followed him everywhere. I learned everything from him by going with him. And I knew how the government works. Okay, I knew how the government works. And today he works with the government to solve so many problems. So he gave me one example. He said, I was given a task. Um, it's a small community of Muslims who had a very deep traditional knowledge on how to do some kind of pottery designing. Okay? 
And so they did that, and they were trying to earn their livelihood. They tried to sell it uh, to the market, and it was not being sold. Now, what does business teach you? Look at product development, how to make it better, right? But the reason has nothing to do with the product. He said that they couldn't sell because all the markets had Hindu people, Hindus. And the Muslims were creating, we are making these little pots. They could not sell it. So you see, you need to know what's happening in our country. We have to look at unity and we have to move it. We have to make sure. So you see, somebody who can stand apart from this issue, he's not just talking about business. He's talking about what you can see what's happening in the society. What is all these different um, uh, religion or, or different, uh, you know, the different faiths that we have? How can we bring that to, to touch the Atma? That is the most important part. So I didn't ask him how he sold his pottery because I'm not a businesswoman. But I was very happy to learn this from him. And after the three hours, I was telling him, you are actually a big uh, academician. You're very good in your business and you have your uh, values with you. And he just smiled and he walked off. So that was the biggest lesson before I came to this place, yeah? And um, so th th you see this. Uh, this is now what happened when Rabindranath Tagore took over Shantiniketan, or he built Shantiniketan. It is re the reason to make... Uh, rigid education flexible. Most of us are going through very rigid education systems because these systems were adopted. The original Gurukula never had timings. Never had timings. Any time the student could approach the teacher because they were in the home of the teacher. But in our case, we have our computers, we communicate. I communicate with the, on WhatsApp with my students. I make sure that their emotional needs are taken care. You know, and their social needs as well. Because if they are worried, they cannot move with their work, we have to help them. So there was a little short uh, ex uh, story on this. There was uh, one morning, a, a student ran and came to the class very late, very late. The teacher was angry, and so the teacher disciplined. Uh, and he said that you will need to be punished, you need to be outside the classroom. So the little boy said, my mother was, my mother was sick today. My mother was sick today, and so, the teacher said, no, 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 not was. My mother is sick today. Is. She's teaching grammar when the boy is emotionally upset. Can you teach grammar to an emotionally upset boy? You cannot. You have to deal with their social and the emotional issues as well. That is why, though we, we all want to attain that guru, guru uh, position of a guru, we need to ensure that we also look at the social, physical, emotional aspects. And there's a lot of literature in the West on this. And I, I'm looking at it. Uh, I will just go quickly that I know many of you are wanting to go off from the room, so. I went through uh, some of the literature philosophers from the West, and then I came across Arthur Schopenhauer. Now he says that a huge diamond, a huge diamond loses its value when it breaks up into bits, right? You will be getting small pieces of diamond. It will shine, but it's not going to shine as a huge diamond. So he also gave an example of an army of soldiers what happens if you break that army into small groups? You lose your strength when you break into small groups. He gave this example, it's not for the army or not for diamonds, but he gave this example for our mind and our memory. These two important concepts that teachers have to target. When you lose your memory or when you do not have or you have not exercised your memory, you will tend to lose the concentration. Concentration is so important. Swami spoke about concentration, and he said about contemplation, then he went to meditation. Okay, so without this, 
immense strength of concentration, we will not be able to have passion or anything. How are we going to develop this concentration? That's important. Now, there's another example. Uh, this, is, uh, this slide is just to show you the influence of it, Guru. Because uh, in, in our textbooks, we see that we need to be role models, right? We have, students have to be role models, student leaders have to be role models, teachers, gurus have to be role models. But remember, after Sadhguru leaves, he leaves you with an influence of what you have to do every time. Sri Satya Sai Baba has given me something to do, which I can't forget. He said, you work for me, I can't stop. The influence is on, his mortal coils have gone, right? So the influence is, can only happen if we can rise to the atmic level, okay? Um, now, Arthur Schopenhauer, I liked his uh, example. He spoke about uh, Mike, yes. So he's given me a paper, he said five minutes left. Uh, so I'll just do it this quickly. Um, now, I have this mic here, and if I'm blind, and I'm supposed to feel this mic, I would say that this is oval and this is long, right? Now, how do I know that this is oval and this is long? Because in class I was taught, this is oval shaped and this is long, right? Now, you have to ask me logically, what is it that you're talking about? We knew because teacher taught us. But how do you know the concept of space? This is occupying space, right? So you have space and the concept of time. We are looking at it. Our eyes, you cannot see this unless there is light. In a dark room, you don't see anything. So it's because the light is reflecting on this object, we're able to see it. It's very limited vision, very limited. We don't see things which we don't know. We can't see. So what he was trying to tell is, in the same way as the same concept in the, as in the Gurukula, to move towards the atmic perspective, all you have to do is remember that once you're with your atma, you're able to, your memory, and the memory is very high when you are one with your atma, when you are in silence, when you meditate. But the minute you, your mind is on, open, there is the concept of time and space. And in this concept of time and space is when you are bound to have your attachment, your misery, or your conflicts. You start thinking, oh, my son didn't do this, my husband didn't do this, or I should have got this, I never got this. It's because we have this concept of time. So you, can you imagine if you go inwards, the concept of time and space becomes small. Very, very small, because you are more inwards. Now you'll ask me, how do I live in this world if I go inside, right? Go inwards. When you go inwards, what happens is time and space is there, but you will know how to use it. You will know how to use it from the atmic principle, okay? I'm going to go forward because of the lack of time. So what happens when you're with your Atma? Your tuition outside becomes intuition. You get the knowledge, okay? So I tried to practice this in Thailand. I went into meditation. And then uh, one of the Saraswati Pujas, I said, I'm going to see whether I can actually do. So I prayed to God saying that, can you tell me what knowledge should I actually deal with? Because I'm not very interested in what's happening currently. And then I saw in my vision in Sanskrit, I'm happy that I knew Sanskrit. It said, Pandida Charchida Mahavakya. Pandida means scholar, Charchida means discuss. Mahavakya is Tattva Masi, that you are God. He's asking me to decide to talk about the Atmic principle, and that's the reason why I, I took this topic today. And this voice comes very loud as you go inwards. And I just shared that with you. Now, this is your conscious mind, subconscious. This is a model by Dr. Jumsai, which I have used in the school. I've researched on this. The United Nations has taken this model to actually implement it for water education. The UN Habitat has taken this up. And I did the evaluation for this particular model and found the children who went through uh, this kind of learning the, learning, the mind of the learner, you're able to actually touch their 
in their heart, okay? Um, and, and this is just a short uh, image on, on peer tutoring and uh, online and blended learning. You can give free education. The earlier speaker has spoken about it. I would not go deep into this. But if you, we want to have access to higher education, the best would be is to go online. And where there is no internet, no problem. Just build a community center, a very small one, a tent. As long as you can have a big screen and you have villages, students sitting there, and you can give them the information that you need to. Practical skills are different, but they need information. People hide information. Because I'm a researcher, I'm on the internet. I can never go into the highest tier of the journals because that is meant only for a certain cream of people. You don't have access to it. So whenever I submit my research for, for journals, it might go into the third third tier, because we can't afford. Every journal, you might have to pay 300 and 400 US dollars. This is the condition of the world. Even if I want to put human values, it might go into the third or the fourth tier. But what I do now, I just put it into the internet. Our Google is very good. It will spread the message of human values, OK? So it is good that we, if all of you can attempt putting your understanding into Google, it'll be good. So the Upanishad, I just want to go quickly. Arthur Schopenhauer, whom I spoke about, he has taken this, and he was reading this, Opnikat. Op that's a word for Upanishad in uh, German. He's a German philosopher. And he said that unless we all turn to the Upanishad, we will continue with our conflicts and mis misery in the world, with the climate change, with the floods, with many of our islands going to go underwater. We know that it's coming, but we, we do not want to change the lifestyle that we have. So we need to go into this. OK, this is the final one. Uh, after I finished my thesis of the Gurukula, I saw this in my vision. Swami said, Bhushan. I saw a scroll of paper. It said, one source, one unity, one power. So I went to find out what the meaning of Bhushan is. Bhushan is glory of the earth. The Gurukula system is the glory of the earth, one source, is nothing but divinity, one unity is humanity, and one power is the power of love. Okay? With this, we have to follow and we have to spread Swami's mission. Thank you very much. Okay. I, I have, I'm sorry, I have, to sub, uh, I have to also summarize what we did now. I'll be very quick. Uh, Ms. Kuna here from NUS University, she said her main message was go out of your comfort zone. Do more than what you plan to do. Do more things, things more courageously. Singapore has uh, a values-driven framework, national values, that also has inculcated self-awareness. And uh, it's now uh, in um, implementing holistic education. Mrs. Smitha Bhatnagar, Ms. P uh, Smitha Bhatnagar spoke about SEVA and how uh, the SEVA manager needs school objectives, how they've touched um, many parts in the community, and they've helped uh, through um, uh, this serving community through trainings, several trainings that they had. And um, finally, I just spoke about Gurukula system, uh, and it is a wonderful thing to end with the convocation, where I would love to pass this message to all of you, to children and students here especially, you have to spread Swami's message. You should be the warriors here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Suma. Such an enlightening talk, touching upon the subtle aspect of education, which Sadhguru always talks about, which is the knowledge of the self. With that, we've come to the close of session four of the National Conference on Making Higher Education Accessible and Available. I would like to call upon Dr. K.P. Sailila to share a few words of gratitude and also pass on the token of love to our wonderful speakers today. My humble pranam, Sat Bhagwan's lotus feet. And on behalf of our University for Human Excellence, I thank all the three distinguished speakers. And all three of you came out with uh, practical experiences, and especially um, 
Sumita Ben and Sudha, Savita Ben and Sudha Ben. Sudha ben. They came out with their own experiences, and it was really very delightful to hear the experiences of uh, all of them. And uh, Madam Dr. Suma, I am really attracted to one uh, statement which you made about the vision that you had, that um, I'm a pilot, and um, I work in a shipping firm. I work in a shipping firm. It was a, it's really very attractive, and I should say that uh, all our uh, students, boys, girls, staff, all of us, for that matter, I think we all feel that we work, we are uh, in the ocean of samsara where our Sadhguru is the only anchor for all of us, and he's definitely <laughs> taking all of us uh, into this journey of life. Thank you, ma'am. Sairam. I request Dr. K.P. Sailila to pass on a token of our love. First to Smita Ben. And also to Dr. Suma. And finally to Madam Kuna. We request all the speakers to stay for a group photo, please.